What's up, guys? Welcome back to another pseudo-podcast with a mild visual component. Today's topic, the tale of the bulky water type. This will be very tranquil. I'm sure this will be relaxing, as well as informative, because my eyes are closed right now. I'm not looking at the screen at all. So, maybe you can do the same. Anyway, now that I'm done teasing my pseudo-ASMR, we will be exploring the roles that bulky water types have occupied over the years, as well as their many excellent traits that have led the term bulky water to become a household name in competitive Pokemon to begin with. And finally, we will be exploring how bulky waters have evolved over the course of many metagames. Not literal Pokemon evolution. So, we will be starting in Gen 3, as that is where the term bulky water originated, with the bulky water being a defensively capable water type that is slappable onto pretty much every team because of its many useful qualities that we'll be going over. But first, you're probably wondering, well, the first two generations had water types, and they were bulky, so... Why didn't uh, the term bulky water start in Gen 2 or even Gen 1? Well, to understand that, we're going to first go over what makes a bulky water a bulky water. So, in Gen 3, you have a lot of dangerous physical attackers. So I'm showing those on the screen if you want to actually look at it now. If not, I'm going to be listing them off anyway. But for those who like to follow along visually and may have been looking away, here's your cue. Anyway, so we've got some big physical attackers. Aero, uh, Aerodactyl, I know some less uh, experienced players are not familiar with the many, many abbreviations that competitive Pokemon players use. So we've got Aerodactyl, Flygon, uh, Metagross, Salamence, and Tyranitar. Those are the big ones. Now there are other physical attackers, but Pokemon like Gyarados and Heracross Part of their appeal is that they are physical attackers that are not stopped by bulky waters. And that speaks to the effect that bulky waters have had on metagames. So, uh, bulk these are huge threats. These arrows, T-Tars, Salamences, Metagrosses. And bulky waters have the typing to not be weak to their common attacks and are able to hit them super effectively, or at least really hard, in return. So they are the group of Pokémon that is most consistently capable of checking a slew of dangerous offensive threats, top-tier offensive threats. It is not easy to replicate the defensive utility of a bulky water. Like, you could try to use Claydol, and Claydol is a pretty good physically defensive Pokémon, but it certainly isn't a Salamence counter or a Metagross counter, and it's not a great solo uh, Tyranitar counter, or Arrow, definitely not. So, uh, you can say the same for every other physical wall, pretty much. I mean, so even something as sturdy as Skarmory is not foolproof against these Pokémon, because it doesn't resist rock. So, and it also doesn't necessarily hurt these Pokémon back very much, so... Skarmory is less of a wall and more of a supporter with spikes, whereas the bulky waters, those are the ones that wall these dangerous physical attackers. Now we go back to GSC, and we will see these kinds of physical attackers are not everywhere. Like, the most prominent physical attacker in GSC is, of course, Snorlax, and bulky waters do not resist normal, and thus they are not... Uh, they are not... Snorlax checks, and in general, if you look at some of the physical attackers here, your Machamps and Marowaks, then water types do not have the same kind of widespread defensive utility that they do in Gen 3. You, know, you do not slap a water type on every team in GSC uh, like, in, like you very well could in advance. I'm not saying bulky waters are required in Gen 3 or later, but there is a reason... The reasons we just went over, those uh, physical attackers with their choice bands and their strong moves and whatnot, those are the reason why bulky waters became so popular as to deserve their own category. You know, that sort of thing does not exist in GSC. Yes, yeah, Suicune is an incredibly bulky Pokemon, but it's not because it's a water type necessarily. 
I mean, it's it definitely makes use of its water typing, but Suicune in GSC is not part of a broad category of bulky Pokemon of the same type that are used for some sort of widespread defensive purpose. No, Suicune is used because it's very good against mixed attackers. It is not comparable to the later generations. Or something like Vaporeon is a sweeper, it's not a defensive uh, Pokemon either. It's got defensive use, but its primary use is sweeping. And Starmie, uh, it's got some defensive use as well, but its primary use is Rapid Spin. So, uh, then of course there's Cloyster, who is you know, doesn't really uh, get the most out of its water typing because of the weaknesses its ice typing brings. But it's also not really used for its... I mean, Cloyster's the closest thing to a water that actually switches into Snorlax, and even then it's, then, it's not a check. It just makes use of Snorlax's presence to get up spikes and, you know, toxic and explode. Uh, maybe spin. So, uh, definitely not comparable to Gen 3, as you can see. And if we go back to Gen 1, then... As you see here, uh, Cloyster again, and Cloyster and Lapras and Starmie, you know, they're not using their water typing because... They're not using their water typing to check threats, they're using their bulk and their stats to check threats. Like, Cloyster and Lapras are very good against Snorlax and Tauros, and Starmie's high speed makes it good against Tauros as well, as well as, as its access to recover. I mean, they certainly appreciate their water typing, uh, like, Starmie really appreciates the ice resistance, but, uh, you know, for Lapras and uh, Cloyster, that's not really important. So, now we know why the bulky water term originated in Gen 3 and not in Gen 2 or 1. So, now that we know what bulky waters do, they generally check uh, physical attackers, the, and you know they're in ge they're generally Pokemon with good stats, so they are able to fill important defensive utility on your team, and they're able to hit back. And of course, not every bulky water is the same, so uh, we are going to look at the defense the bulky waters in each generation and their various defense their differences, what unique traits they have that separate them from each other even though they do fall under the broader category of bulky water. So, uh, and then we will go over the non-bulky waters, because uh, the six water types uh, on the screen right now are not the only waters in advance by a long shot, but that's an ad, okay. Uh, but these are, well actually, uh, only the first three or four are real true defensive bulky waters. But I wanted to mention Starmie and Gyarados as well because of their unique traits. And uh, they're almost anti-bulky waters in a way, but we'll get there. So, the most defining bulky water in advance is Swampert. So, what Swampert has over every other water type is an immunity to the sandstorm that pervades advance OU. This means it gets passive recovery with leftovers. And matter of fact, every defensive Swampert uses Protect just to squeeze as much leftovers recovery as it possibly can. So uh, that's Swampert's thing. Its ground typing gives it uh, sand immunity, thus allowing it to get passive recovery, and even more well, equally importantly is its rock resistance. No other water type besides Quagsire. <laughs> you know, that's a whole different thing. Quagsire is not really a thing. We'll get to that. Uh, I want to be comprehensive without mentioning stuff that isn't really a thing. So, anyway, so Swampert is immune to sand and resists rock. So this is really key. This is what separates it from the other bulky waters. These are game-breakingly important traits. You know, the sand, uh, being affected by sand is a major hindrance of the other waters. And not being able to resist the other waters, uh, the, not being able to resist rock is also a major hindrance for the other waters when two of the threats they are tasked with dealing with uh, is are Swampert and Tyranitar, especially Tyranitar, whose rock slides are really strong. I mean, you can try to out-bulk Arrow, you'll be and you'll be fearing rock slide flinches because it's so fast and you're not resisting the move, but it's, uh, but you are ca generally capable of doing that. But with Tyranitar's massive attack and, you know, Dragon Dance, then you're generally going to want to be taking attacks that it doesn't have stab on. So on the physical side, that's rock slide in Gen 3. For those who are less experienced, then there's a 
the special physical split in Gen 3 is based on type. So Crunch is a special attack on Titar in Gen 3. So, uh, all right. So Swampert resists rock, heals passively in sand, and I cannot stress enough how important that is. Uh, just for the just to give you an idea of how much of a direct comparison this is, Suicune is in terms of sheer bulk the absolute bulkiest Pokemon. So let me just put a sample Swampert set here. Actually, the most standard pert is EQ Ice Beam. A lot of people will run Surf and Protect and then Roar or Refresh, but something like this is generally fine. Actually, it should be a lot more defense. This much special defense. Uh, oh, another trait you might be thinking I've forgotten is that Swampert is a water type immune to electric, which is definitely true. However, a Swampert's ground typing does come with the double-edged sword of making it quad weak to grass, so electric types slap on HP grass a lot. Uh, you know, you would never ever dream of initially countering a Zapdos with Swampert until you knew it had HP ice, for example. So uh, that is very important to be aware of. Otherwise, it will not. Uh, otherwise, you're going to switch Swampert in and get met with a nasty surprise. So. Uh, the grass weakness is definitely something that can be taken advantage of. Things like Metagross, Titar, Salamence, the big three physical attackers, they often run mixed sets uh, with HP Grass just to get by Swampert. Now Swampert is bulky and can take an HP Grass, but it means it's not going to be taking them on throughout the game. However, this is where opportunity cost comes in. If they're running HP Grass, that's a valuable move slot and can be taken advantage of elsewhere. For example, a DD Titar with HP Grass is not going to have HP Bug, so it's going to struggle with something like Celebi or you know even Flygon. So, and uh, you can also do similar pairings like Swampert plus Flygon or Celebi. So whether the Zapdos or Jolteon has HP Grass or HP Ice, one of the two will wall it. You gotta be careful when pairing it with Celebi because Zapdos likes to run Drill Peck now, but it's nothing insurmountable. Drill Peck is also an easy switch for a T-Tar, so. Uh, generally, you don't hard counter one Pokemon. You don't hard counter swaths of Pokemon with one Pokemon. Like, you don't use Swampert and have an endless counter to all these physical attackers, especially because Metagross likes to explode a lot, which is another thing that Protect is important in thwarting. But you have a huge way of you have a hugely consistent way of stopping it from immediately ravaging the rest of your team, and if it does use the tools to take out your Swampert, then that can be taken advantage of with your other Pokemon. For example, if you are expecting that Metagross to HP Grass your Swampert, you can grab a free switch to your Zapdos or Salamence or Will O Wisp Gengar or your Moltres, and voila. So. Uh, but you can't just have that Salamence or Moltres or will o -Wisp Gengar or Zapdos because those don't stave off Metagross's Meteor Mash nearly as well as Swampert does. You have to have that initial thing. You have to have that initial buffer against these Pokemon, and that's why Bulky Waters are so good. Even if those Pokemon have the tools to get around Bulky Waters, then that comes at the cost of something. I mean, so does everything in Pokemon but it also means that your supporting cast will be able to adapt to their weaknesses. It's very important. Bulky Waters are not these unkillable Toxapex figures, uh, to draw a more modern Bulky Water comparison, but they are very important in their defensive utility. So, Anyway, we've gone over Swampert, and I want to now mention Suicune, who in terms of sheer bulk is unbeatable in advance, uh, in terms of waters. So... The thing is with Suicune is, we mentioned with Swampert, it has that sand immunity, which allows it to heal passively. So even though Suicune blows Swampert out of the water in terms of actual bulk, then it is not nearly as good a physical wall because it doesn't heal. So yeah, it's not going to take too much from a Salamence HP flying, but it's also not healing it off. So Salamence will just switch out, come back in, keep walling Suicune, and Suicune can't heal outside of rest, and that is exploitable. So, not only will you not be able to heal passively, but when you do heal, you are 
completely dominated by the Pokemon you're supposed to be checking. So, uh, that is... Oh, and Suicune also does not resist rock, meaning it is not a very reliable, consistently reliable at least, answer to Tarantar and Arrow. Now, don't get me wrong, Suicune can be very good in helping you play around these Pokemon, However, it restricts your team building a lot more, because as soon as you run a non-Swampert water type, you need your bulky water to be backed up by something else to handle those rock types and those physical attackers. This is why Metagross is incredibly popular alongside non-Swampert bulky waters, excuse me, because it resists most choice banded attacks. So your rock slides, your double edges, your HP flyings. So you are able to protect your bulky water from those strong hits that they're going to struggle to shrug off in sand. Or shrug off because they don't resist it. So Metagross is also popular alongside Swampert, but it's a lot more... I don't want to say required, because that sounds restrictive. But you definitely want to... you need some sort of consideration for those strong Rock-type moves and those moves you're not going to be healing off. And Metagross is oftentimes the most splashable because of how good it is against pretty much everything. So, something like Metagross or a Jirachi. Uh, so, uh, or Claydol as well. So, now, what does Suicune do specifically besides be bulky? Well, call mind. Suicune is a bulky water that can go on the offensive and sweep. And it's very difficult to deal with because it's also a special attacker that does not care for Blissey. It just sets up on it and rests and... Uh, then the last move can be Roar for other Calm Mind Suicunes, or Ice Beam for Salamence checking, or uh, Sleep Talk. Sleep Talk is risky in advance because the sleep mechanics mean that if you Sleep Talk without waking up and then are forced to switch out, then you have not burned any Sleep Turns. So, uh, sleep If you're running Sleep Talk, you should generally be running a Modest Suicune, which is a more offensive spin. Uh, so I want to mention that Swampert and Suicune can go on the offensive, but this also cuts into their defensive use, uh, strictly in terms of being able to take hits. Uh, now, you are still going to be able to take hits with them nicely because they're naturally bulky, even without investment. However, and, and you also gain a lot of, you gain new avenues of being able to check things because you hit harder and you're faster, which means instead of checking Pokemon through sheer bulk, then you are checking them through a combination of your bulk as well as your speed giving you more opportunities and uh, your added power doing the same. However, with uh, Swampert at least heals in, even in Sand, but with Offensive Suicune this is very noticeable because it doesn't have the bulk to be taking hits, so you really have to be careful about not switching it into attacks if you want to actually accomplish much with it. Whereas Defensive Suicune, the true bulky water Suicune, at least can be a little more cavalier in switching into attacks. So I generally think Roar is the most consistent on Suicune, just for other Calm Mind Suicunes and things like Curse Lax and uh, Calm Mind Jirachis as well. So. Uh, yes, Wikun is really nice, nasty, but it needs support. Now, Milotic. Milotic is perhaps the truest bulky water. It does not resist rock, and it does not heal passively in sand, but it has Recover, which has 32 PP in advance, and makes Milotic really, really nasty. And another trait of the non-Swampert bulky water is that they are only regularly weak to grass instead of quad weak to grass. So this means that an HP grass from a Titar or Salamence uh, or Metagross is not threatening these waters in the way it would Swampert. So again, trade-offs. So, and Milotic, now, now Suicune, if it takes a mixed men's HP grass in sand, it's really in trouble because it's going to take a pretty nasty chunk, and if it wants to heal it off, then it's going to have to rest and become very vulnerable, and you know, that's the Suicune dilemma. Now, but Milotic is not deterred at all. Milotic has enormous special bulk and will just heal those attacks right off. So Milotic is impossible for mixed sweepers to break because of that brutal recovery, and it's also not easy to take out with defensive Pokemon either because of the combination of Toxic and Refresh alongside 32 PP Recover and a very strong uninvested Surf. You'll notice that it has the highest base special attack of the three waters we've looked at so far. 
So switching something like an offensive Zapdos into into Surf with Sand Up, you know, kind of stings. My Lodic also has a lot of, uh, a lot of cool options like Hypnosis and uh, can also use Ice Beam, of course, but it generally gets the job done against Salamence with just Toxic. So my Lodic is bulky enough to avoid a 2 a KO from Choice Band Salamence, HP Flying, and it definitely wants support against something like DD Tar and, you know, uh, CB especially, as well as backup against Arrow, just like a Suicune would, but it's a lot more flexible. It doesn't offer the same sweet potential that Suicune does because it doesn't have Calm Mind, but it's also incredibly hard to take advantage of. I mean, even Swampert, even though it doesn't heal, uh, even though it heals in sand, sometimes relying on Protect makes it very vulnerable because it's scrapping for 6% at a time, whereas Milotic, it just you know, gets back 50% and it's a lot harder to take advantage of. And uh, even something like a max special attack Zapdos Thunderbolt isn't going to KO it, so it can toxic you and you know, bounce back and very, very difficult to take down. Milotic, I mean, in terms of longevity, then Swamper still beats it out because Milotic gets hindered a lot by spikes. So when it constantly has to recover, then it's not nearly as much of a threat. Milotic is mo at its most threatening when it's throwing out Surfs and Toxics and only recovering when there's an opposing team an opposing offensive team that's hitting it a lot. Uh, but against Spike's teams, then you don't want to, you're just going to be useless if you keep recovering. So, Milotic requires more support, uh, so therefore Swamper by default is naturally more inclined to stick around because it's not worn down by sand. But in terms of you know, shrugging hits off, uh, Milotic is pretty unbreakable. So, yeah, uh, now we go to Vaporeon, who has an interesting niche. My, Vaporeon has been called a discount Milotic before, and that's not exactly wrong. Wish support seems really nice. That is definitely unique among water types. However, the problem is that it requires Protect in order to actually receive its own wish, and therefore it that, that's a crucial move slot that it loses. It would love to, in addition to Surf, the obligatory Surf, and uh, Haze, then it would love to run Toxic and even Roar, but, you know, it, and, you know, picking between two of those three would be fine, or even Ice Beam as well, but when you only get to choose one, then that's, because Wish Protect, Surf are non-negotiable, then that really sucks. So, uh, that said, Vaporeon does have some nice traits. It has an even higher special attack that, uh, special attack stat than Milotic, so there's that, but uh, of course it has doesn't have the 32 recover PP of uh, recover. <laughs> Instead, it has to rely on the 16 PP wish, and it has to protect, which means it's really easy to switch around because its protect is so forced, and it has to risk it risks way too much for a defensive Pokemon to not protect. Meaning you get free switches to Zapdos and Celebi and whatever else all day long, and. Uh, it can't fit, it doesn't even learn Refresh, I don't believe, but it definitely can't fit it. So, you, uh, you're deathly afraid of status, mainly toxic, and yeah, you just can't fit all the moves in addition to those. So, uh, that and the fact that, you know, it can't even hurt Salamence much with this set. You know, it can fit toxic, but then it loses one of its main, quali main uh, good po selling points. So... Uh, you have to keep that in mind. You have to support Vaporeon. I mean, I know it's a support Pokemon, but you have to be aware of its shortcomings as a water. You know, it's a lot less readily available to thwart the things it's supposed to be checking than Milotic, just because of how exploitable the Wish Protect combo can be. However, Vaporeon does have some crucial, crucial, solid traits. Besides the one uh, unique traits, sorry. As opposed to just the 110 base special attack, which is admittedly really nice for you know, two KOing bulky T-Tar through lefties, then you uh, also have Water Absorb, and this is really crucial because a lot of stall teams are deathly afraid of Calm Mind Suicune, again, the bulky water. Like Milotic, uh, Milotic is setup fodder for Suicune because it rests off or you know even sub, but for pretty much, for very many Calm Mind Suicune variants out there, then you just uh, are completely immune to their water moves, even at plus six, and what's more, you can haze those boosts away. So, 
even if the Suicune is at plus six, you can haze and then you can switch out to something else now that the Suicune's boosts have been removed, which makes it a lot easier to deal with. And haze is also nice for... I mean, it's kind of small and you would love to have roar or toxic, but haze is just generally the safest. But uh, being able to check Suicune as well as it does is a major selling point of Vaporeon. And although it can sometimes have some trouble pulling it off while still uh, staying healthy itself, then uh, Wish is undeniably amazing support since it gives a, fit, a teammate 50% of its health back. That's really huge in keeping things like Skarmory healthy to thwart things like Metagross. Uh, so, all right, so our three main water, bulky waters of advance, Swampert, Milotic, Suicune. Then you have the semi Milotic that's uh, gonna fit on certain kinds of stall teams uh, in Vaporeon. Now, Starmie and Gyarados. Now, we are not talking offensive Starmie because offensive Starmie is a uh, is an offensive water. You know, just like we mentioned offensive variants of Swampert and Suicune, but they less readily embrace the notion of the bulky water type. The bulky water sticks around and handles those threats throughout the game, whereas the offensive uh, versions of Swampert and Suicune you know, use their natural bulk and typing to get in, but then are focused more on blowing holes in the opponent's team. And Starmie offensively is more of a cleaner. So we are exploring the defensive set more so, which uh, Starmie has some unique traits among bulky waters too. It's not a traditional one, and again, you are going to have to support it, but it has some nice traits. So already among its moves, you see those. You see Rapid Spin, and then of course you see Recover, uh, just like Milotic, but, excuse me, uh, unlike Milotic, it has Natural Cure, which is amazing, meaning it just switches out and Toxic is gone. And uh, so Spin is, of course, enormous and uh, unique. And Thunder Wave is great support, although Thunder Wave can also be psychic uh, so, uh, for, spin, for spinning against Gengar, excuse me. So, uh, there are a lot of EV spreads that this Starmie can take. Uh, this fast spread is the most intuitive, you know, something like this for outspeeding all Gengar and psychicking it and having some physical bulk for things like Doug. Some special attack for you know, hitting T-Tar, Pursuit T-Tar and Gengar harder, and some special bulk for Living Crunch in Sand. You can mess around with the EVs a lot here, but the general, no matter what the EVs are, the general idea of Bulky Starmie stays the same. It is a spinner that is not ruined by Toxic uh, without having to waste a slot on Refresh. It has Recover to stall things like non-Toxic Blissey, so it's great in longer games because of how good Recover is. Keeping spikes off the field is huge, and supporting your team with Thunder Wave is even nicer. Now, where does this Starmie fail? Well... Uh, while it can be pretty tanky with some investment, I mean, a lot of players are starting to run Bold Starmie, which can take a lot of pretty nasty attacks. At the same time, it's not nearly as bulky as the other Pokemon, because you know, even Milotic. Milotic's defense stat is actually lower than Starmie's, but Milotic also has much more HP. And Milotic does not have the speed stat, the need to use speed like Starmie does, because Starmie needs to be abusing... Uh, at speed. Even with the bold nature, you still need to throw some investment in there, so it can't really afford to max it out. And even then, its low HP stat is really going to hold it back. So the lowest I'd go is somewhere around here. 270, maybe 274 if you're afraid of uh, Jolly Max Clay at all, but 270 is also acceptable. So, uh, even even then. So, you've got that. It's not that much bulkier than Milotic physically. The lower defense holds it back. But And there's that, and that really holds it back against Arrow and something like Salamence. It definitely can't switch into Choice Band Salamence safely, especially if it's going, even if it's going bold, because it's so, it's now slower, and it's not avoiding the two at KO. So, and if it's timid, it obviously takes way too much. And it has similar issues against Tyranitar and Aerodactyl. So, in terms of switching into Metagross, then yes, a defensive Starmie can be very good. But it's not as generally going to struggle more against the T Tars and the Arrows and the Menses. So, you know, if you can force Metagross to blow up on your Starmie, that is generally positive because it means your backup physical wall, which you must have alongside Starmie, is going to be protected. However, you do need to be aware that you are going to need that backup physical wall to begin with. 
Now, finally, Gyarados. Now, Gyarados is... Starmie can sometimes act as a sort of bulky water, because, again, ch uh, checking Metagross is no joke. And, uh, yeah, can't check Star uh, Salamence. You know, Suicune still kind of can. It can scout for it against Choice Band. With Ice Beam, it's a pretty good check to DD, because it takes so little, even in Sand. And uh, it's the mix Mints you got to watch out for, whereas Milotic shuts down mix Mints, but can definitely have the physical defensive use you need, uh, where Starmie can falter in that regard. Although, in terms of ruining DD Mints, then Bolt Starmie is great at that, but it's the band variants you got to watch out for. And Vaporeon similarly struggles. But yeah, Gyarados has the problem of being affected by sand, but... On the other hand, Gyarados is immune to spikes, which is really nice. However, Gyarados also doesn't heal, and Gyarados also has the very negative trait of being weak to Rock Slide. Now, a water type with Intimidate is amazing. A water type with Intimidate and a Spikes immunity? Good god, that's amazing. A water type with a bug and fighting resistance, meaning it actually checks hair across, unlike these others? Wow, that's really something. But it's still not a... Uh, a bulky water type because rock resist or, or sorry not even a rock neutrality it's straight up rock weak there's no checking arrow and salamence with this i mean you can pivot around it but between its reliance on rest for recovery like uh, the dragon dance rest gyarados is uh is a very good set but it aims more at stalling out pokemon that can't really hurt it like my Lodic, uh, while not completely succumbing to sand I have an Eevee spread somewhere, but I don't remember it. But it's not important. The specifics of the spreads are not important in this video. But, uh, th like, this, for example, can live a Starmie Thunderbolt. Uh, but... Yeah, and uh, Gyarados is, of course, immune... Or, not immune. It's neutral to grass as well. So, again, very unique traits for a water type. However, you can't use it as a bulky water because that rock slide weakness is just going to burn you. It can definitely be some nice support for physical walls, like Gyarados and Metagross. Their synergy type-wise is amazing. You can play around physical attacks beautifully with Intimidate and Metagross absorbing the ones it resists, which are, like, like rock, uh, rock is resisted by it and it's aimed at Gyra, so perfect. Earthquake is aimed at Metagross and Gyra is immune and has Intimidate to weaken it even further, so perfect. So... I did want to mention Gyarados because it is a bulky water, it is a water type and it does have a lot of bulk and it does have a lot of other great defensive traits, but it does not have the the, tra the traits necessary, i.e. not being weak to rock, that the other bulky waters have. So, that said, you know, its traits are really nice, but it's not a traditional bulky water. So now we're going to go over the other waters real quick uh, that you'll see in advance and why they're not bulky. Cloyster is another bulky water that, or is another water type that is bulky, but it is also a water type that is weak to rock because of its ice typing. If Cloyster was pure water, it'd be so good, but unfortunately, no. And that water, that half ice typing also makes it neutral to Metagross's Meteor Mash, for example. So Cloyster is best as a, an offensive spiker. You're not going to be getting walling done with it. You are going to be... Oh God, Cloyster is ice typing, making it weak to Swampert's focus punch. is just the worst. But offensive Swampert's, of course. So, yeah, Cloyster is a fast offensive spiker. So you are going to uh, get better use out of it if you are using it aggressively as opposed to using it to check threats. So... Uh, again, now we understand why DD Gera and you know, SD Heracross are so good as physical attackers, because unlike the other physical attackers we've mentioned, as well as Flygon, then they are not bothered by bulky waters at all. So, uh, yeah. Now we are moving on to... Oh, uh, another important bulky water trait that I want to mention before... Uh, actually, no. First, we're going to go over the other waters. There's only a couple. So then we're going to go to BL and uh, Kingdra. Not Lapras, because that's not seen, but Kingdra and Ludicolo. You know, they have some nice defensive utility, but uh, they are... They are offensive waters. They're Rain Dance, Swift Swim Sweepers, so they are not used for their defensive utility. Now, I want to mention uh, Advance OU is historically not known for its fire types, specifically because its fires have 
long been held back by the presence of Tyranitar and Bulky Waters. However, when Swampert is so dominantly the premier Bulky Water, then Fire types lose a counter because the main coverage they come equipped with is HP Grass. So your Moltres, Charizard, Blaziken, you know, they're not countered by Swampert. They're not countered by the Water type. What they do hate is facing Milotic. Milotic holds them back like little else, but. Uh, Swampert, you know, that's one reason fire types have become more popular in recent years in advance because the other waters, you know, players realize just how vulnerable they were to uh, being worn down by banded rock slides and sand, and that's why everyone gravitates to Swampert because it's really hard to stop DD Tar and CB Tar and CB Arrow otherwise. But as a result, you're left with a water type that is very vulnerable to fire types. And that is what has led to the fire type explosion of the, not the, not a literal explosion that is typed fire. Good lord, that'd be crazy. But that has led to the influx of fire types, especially Moltres and Charizard, that we have seen in advance over the last couple of years. So, uh, the role of the bulky water in staving off fires is more prominent in the fourth generation, where we will go now. So, now uh, we're going to change these sets, but a lot of these Pokemon are. You know, I don't even have to change the six Pokemon in the team builder right now. Swampert, Milotic, Suicune, Vaporeon, Starmie, Gyarados. Because uh, those are pretty much the main bulky waters in Gen 4 as well. I mean, you've also got Empoleon, who we'll definitely get to. But these are the main ones that you think of when you think bulky water. And I think Generation 4 is, uh, you know, with the influx, with the boost in popularity that competitive battling received during the fourth generation, then that's where more and more people started becoming aware of bulky water as a term. It was no longer just elite net battle advanced players who referred to bulky waters. Now it was something that everyone knew what it was. That's why it's so popular even today. So, you know, people would casually refer to, oh yeah, I have to get rid of waters with this team in Gen 3, and then that sort of lexicon becoming popular with the boom in competitive battling in Gen 4 is a lot of because you know, bulky water as a term originated in Gen 3, but it would I would absolutely argue that it got popular in Gen 4 because uh, it was because Gen 4 opened the floodgates of competitive battling to more casual players because uh, net battle was relatively obscure. And thus you attracted a lot of, I mean, okay, you definitely attracted people who were just messing around and having fun, but you attracted a more competitive clientele, I guess you could phrase it like that. So you know, now people who have barely ever had a mindset of being competitive you know, know what a bulky water is. And this has been the case ever since Gen 4 was the main gen over a decade ago. So... I would say this is where it like really took off and became popular. It was a household name in Gen 3, but this is where it became its it became as known as it was. As it is now, rather. So now we go to Swampert. Uh, so we're gonna go over these waters once again in the context of Gen 4. So uh, Swampert's last move set move set is generally Ice Beam or Roar. Or no no, sorry, Roar or Protect. Uh, so what does Swampert do now in the fourth generation? Now, what changes? Well, sand is still everywhere. It's not as necessary for offense to, for offense to function, but at the same time, sand is still very popular. So having a water type that can uh, stave off things like Tyranitar and you know, take other hits in sand is very valuable. So. Uh, Swampert also has access to the best move in the game, Stealth Rock. So suddenly you have this super slappable wall that also supports your team with one turn with the best move in the game. So yeah, Swampert becomes incredibly popular once again. You know, checking pretty much everything because it's so hard to hit it super effectively because of how good water ground is as typing. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention Quagsire in Gen 3, but that's because it's not really a thing. It's a gimmicky Suicune counter. Uh, that's it. It's not very good. It's a gimmicky Suicune counter that also heals in Samba or Resist Rock, but its typing isn't very good and it doesn't heal. And its bulk isn't as good, and that means healing with Protect isn't as reliable. So, Anyway, so Water Ground, very, very good typing. Makes it hard. Now, uh, in addition to physical attackers like uh, T-Tar and Flygon and Salamence when it was in the tier, 
uh, and then Dragonite afterwards. In addition to encountering things like that and Metagross and physical Jirachi, uh, then Sizzle, then uh, two fire types are now very much OU. They're not obscure at all as fire types used to be in advance. Heatran and Infernape are very top tier OU Pokemon. So being able to sponge their fire hits uh, with a water type is obviously very much desirable and being able to heal off those hits by healing in sand is of course great with Swampert and that's something that other waters cannot do. So uh, that's a big one. However, again, that grass weakness comes into play big time because uh, Scarf Tran at least does not run HP Grass because it's bad and get locks into a move. But offensive Heatran sets that switch up their moves and have HP Grass will quickly dispose of Swampert like it was nothing. And the same goes for uh, Mix Infernape with Grass Knot, which was for the, long, for the longest time the very standard set. Now, when Swampert's popularity was... or when rather when... Uh, as metagames go through various phases, then you know, different sets become popular. And you know, for a long time, Infernape was not running Grass Knot, and you know, Swampert was a pretty good check to it. But uh, it's got to be careful of that, and it's a good check to Scarf Heatran for sure. But it's also got to watch out for those. So again, trade-offs. You can pivot your Gengar into a Heatran HP Grass or Infernape Grass Knot and completely snatch the momentum back from them. And uh, Gengar can also take close combats from things like Lucario that Swampert doesn't want to take. So, and uh, so uh, yeah, there's that. Uh, we also the bulky waters were affected in Gen 4 by Breloom, who was a physical attacker who completely ripped them apart. But we'll get to that later. So, Swampert again. If you've ever played Gen 4, you know it's amazing. And nowadays it tends to go more offensive again, just to be less of a sitting duck. But this tank set is still very good. Uh, people tend to run Waterfall over Roar now, and they tend to run some attack EVs, but again, uh, Swampert's ability to take hits from things like CB and Dragonite are invaluable. Switching it to Titar, Physical Jirachi, shrugging it off, you gotta have Physical Bulk on it to do that. So, while the, again, while the EVs and the movesets may slightly change, the general idea remains the same. So now we go to Milotic, and Milotic's actually UU in Gen 4, and it was amazing there, but... Uh, it also is absolutely amazing in OU, so uh, it its recover is now 16 PP, so it's not as crazy, and Stealth Rock being on every team means that it is going to be, it's not quite as invincible as it uh, was in the previous generation, where spikes were not on every team, and hit, things generally hit less hard, because there weren't, there wasn't Life Orb flying around, as well as attacks like Draco Meteor. However, Milotic is excellent because, first of all, it's a great... Its special defense is huge, so... And uh, it's got instant recovery, so as far as Heatran counters go, it is one of the best. I mean, Heatran might explode on it, but then Heatran's gone, so... Uh, Milotic's bulk definitely also falters a little bit with the stronger attacks. Like, CB Tar doesn't just run you know, some stuff in the Rock Slide or now Crunch range, it runs Stone Edge. And even uh, bigger is Dragonite running something like Ban Outrage. I mean, it can still take one, but it's not switching in and staving those hits off like it did in advance, especially with Stealth Rock. So, now there's that. But it is also very resilient at taking hits. So, it stays alive against physical and special attackers alike. And it's able to completely counter Pokemon that are really difficult to deal with otherwise. Like, it's one of the safest answers to Kingdra, a Pokemon that is famously difficult to handle with the disparity in counters between its... Not disparity, but with the difference in counters between its uh, special and mixed and uh, fully physical sets. So, you switch in. If it DDs, you haze. If it's anything else, you just sit on it. So... Uh, Milotic speed also comes into play a lot because it is naturally very fast for a water and it runs, um, it, it naturally outruns a lot of T-Tar and Breloom variants, which alongside its ice, its, uh, ice beam for Breloom and just generally a good special attack stat is nasty. Now waters have to watch out in this generation because T-Tar now gets a special defense boost in sand, so, you know, Milotic Surf is not exactly threatening to 2 a KO, even offensive variants. But it still gets the job done, especially with Haze resetting Dragon Dance. Uh, hey, it did not have Haze in Gen 3. It would have been incredible if it did, but uh, that was a Gen 4 edition. So, 
yeah, this Milotic is also a great answer to things like Mixed Dragonite, Mixed Flygon. A generally tough to KO, and uh, it, with some help, you know, Crocoon, the Rest Sleep Talk Suicune, will outstall it because of pressure, but with some help and Haze resetting the boost, then it will get the job done nicely. And uh, it's also, incidentally, one of the best counters to Offensive Swampert, just like in Gen 3, so... Milotic is, again, the raw, bulky water, and it's not as easy to fit as Swampert. Swampert is very splashable, again, because that Stealth Rock Resistance, another trait of Swampert's, uh, Stealth Rock Resistance and Sand Immunity, and access to Stealth Rock makes it really easy to slot on whatever team you like, whereas Milotic is generally relegated to defensive, spikish, or spiking, stallish stuff, but it is absolutely amazing at doing that. Now, Suicune. Suicune can run the Sleep Talk set here nicely, and it is really tough to deal with. Again, doesn't like Stealth Rock everywhere, but it's still an absolute monster to contend with. Uh, it's a fantastic stall breaker, just like the rest Sleep Talk set was in advance before the mechanics were discovered in 2015. That Sleep Talk burns Sleep Turn, or doesn't burn Sleep Turns if you use it without switching out. Or if you uh, don't not sleep talk before switching out. So basically, if you have Suicune in and it's rested, zero turns, and then you use sleep talk as Zapdos comes in and you get whatever, and then you switch out, then you have not burned a sleep turn without sleep talking, and thus you still have two turns of sleeping when you come back in. So that's why it stopped being used outside of really offensive sets who could make it worthwhile with their hard-hitting sleep talked uh, calm-minded surfs. So... Uh, but in Gen 4, those mechanics are not... <laughs> those mechanics are no more, and you can sleep talk to your heart's desire. So, uh, Defensive Suicune. Again, it's like my Lodic, except you are definitely accepting that you are not going to be able to thwart things like Gengar and Heatran with it consistently. Again, because of the reliance on rest for recovery. And yeah, sleep talk makes it still threatening while asleep, but you are definitely not going to be able to stave off an offensive Heatran the way that my Lodic would, for example. Uh, so, like, even if you switch in with Specs, Heatran, Overheat, which you take pretty well, but rocks and sand and you're not healing it off without rest, you know, Milotic doesn't care about that at all. It'll just recover, but Suicune becomes vulnerable when it has to heal off attacks. So you definitely use it as a mix of playing around things like Flygon and Swampert and whatnot, because it is a defensive beast still. But you use it as a mix of that and uh, the offensive threat it presents. So you definitely have to be aware that with your team building that you are not going to you're not slapping on an immovable wall here so uh yeah that's that's suicune for you now vaporeon uh which commonly ran hp electric or toxic now vaporeon used to be the quintessential bulky water in gen 4 it was slapped on just about every single team it was almost as common as swampert and i mean it was hard to kill for offense it was a great check to most infernape sets and, you know, Wish Support hits hard naturally, perfect Gyarados counter, because Gyarados goes physical now, so it's even more dangerous to more teams. So, yeah, Vaporeon was great. So, what knocked it out of the meta? We don't see defensive Vaporeon ever anymore, and we haven't for more than half a decade. Well, uh, it started when Infernape started running more physically invested sets, like the physical mix set with max attack, and then choice band. You know, it, it takes the special mixed set with 64 attack EVs, it takes those close combats all day, and it's very light, so Grass Knot doesn't threaten it at all. Uh, but, and now it's it's a lot, lot worse off in that regard, with Infernape running more and more physical defense. But the main issues were, again, realizing just how exploitable Wish Protect was, and it's low speed. And it's low speed means that it is incredibly exploitable by most Breloom variants. Now compare this to Milotic, who just pretty much directly outclasses it, because it doesn't have to take two slots up on recover on recovery, rather. It has a nice speed stat without any investment at all. So, and with the strong ice beam, it's not complete Breloom food, whereas Vaporeon would have to choose between it's moved to deal with Gera, so Haze or HP Electric, because my little can also run Haze, and or uh, Ice Beam. So it's you know a very a very difficult dilemma. So yeah. Oh, Haze uh, Milotic also completely ruins Subpatia Agility and Polion, which is nice. Uh, 
but yeah, so you gotta make too many choices with this. And then there was the fact that this was not worth it when things like Bulky Starmie and then Clefable leapt into the metagame. I mean, those Pokemon take advantage of Milotic too, but Milotic is at least worth using against offense as well, teams with Breloom, because it has the extra speed, it has the extra coverage, and uh, so it's a lot more worth the trouble than Vaporeon. And of course, it's special bulk. I mean, and, you know, this makes it better against HP Grass Heatran as well. So, uh, yeah, again, Milotic just outdid Vaporeon. As nice as Wish was, it just wasn't enough. That low speed and the reliance on two moves for recovery, hindering its coverage, and thus the amount of Pokemon I was able to check, just completely knocked Vaporeon out of the meta. Now Milotic is definitely the top tier pure bulky water again. You know, and then Suicune again with its mix of... You know, Suicune's not perfect defensively, but it threatens sweeps very nicely. Now, in Gen 4, then Starmie also sometimes runs bold, but you gotta run you know, around... You know, you gotta outrun Heatran at least, so 279 minimum. Lucario tends to not run Crunch anymore, and it can E-speed. and yeah. So, uh, But generally, the spread you're gonna be seeing is the one that outspeeds Gengar, because in Gen 3, Gengar never runs max speed, and now... In Gen 4, it only runs max speed, so... Uh, yeah, so the last move can be Psychic, Thunderbolt, Reflect, uh, T-Wave. Thunderbolt is generally the nicest. Actually, Psychic is also good because it doesn't invite in Breloom, and inv doesn't invite in Spiking Roserade, so Psychic is uh, very nice. And uh, the Thunderbolt makes it a great Gyarados counter, but it really depends. But again, specifics of EVs and move, move sets are not important. Bulky Starmie is, again, it's not the bulkiest, but, and the thing is that you are not going to be taking on big physical attackers with it, like your Dragonites and your uh, Tyranitars, you know, that's not what it does, because uh, now the physical special split is based on attack, so T-Tar runs Crunch, you know, not just HP Bug, so, uh, you but, what Starmie does is it handles the two fire types. You know, the focus is less on the big physical attackers and now on the fires in Gen 4. And Starmie handles the fires nicely. It's not a perfect counter by any means. Like, Infernape U-turning out of Starmie is the worst. And Heatran's HP Grass still stings it pretty hard, especially with Pasho Berry to soak up the Surf or Hydro. So, it's definitely not immovable. But it's fast, it's bulky enough, it gets rid of hazards still, and it checks them nicely. So, Starmie was a big deal when it first started popping up in popularity post Dragon's Ban, and then uh, Stealth Rock and Heatran was everywhere, and you know Shuka Berry sets with Fire Blast, Earth Power, Explosion, and Starmie just sat on it all day, and it really forced the meta to adapt to its presence. So nowadays, Starmie is not so hot in terms of just being a defensive wall that spins and whatnot, but it's still. Uh, you know, an important Pokemon to consider, and yeah, fact is that Starmie has had a more of an impact because in terms of handling the fire types, it's, you know, I, I don't know if it's purely better than the others, because something like a Specs Heatran over here still rocks it, but its speed is really, you know, the Gen 4 metagame, its offensive threats got faster and faster, so Starmie's speed is a nice way of counteracting that without pure reliance on the... without purely relying on its bulk. And you can even see the same concept in Milotic being better than Vaporeon, in part because it's faster. I mean, the coverage is also big, but in part, that being faster than a Choice Band Tarantar is invaluable. So, again, this is part of the evolution of the bulky water. I mean, we even see it in advance that this concept retroactively applied after seeing how it works in other generations. You know, using you know, relying less on the sheer bulk of these Pokemon, and instead relying on their, you know, natural bulk, and opening up more opportunities for them via added power and speed, making them more flexible. I mean, it certainly makes them more vulnerable in some cases, like in Gen 3, then if your Swampert is offensive, then you really gotta watch out and back it up against things like Arrow, DD Tar, DD Mence, but the fact of the matter is that it's going to take some CB Rock Slides early in the game you know, fairly similarly, and it opens up new avenues of pressure for it to go more offensive rather than being a pure bulky Pokemon. Makes it more threatening, makes it less of a sitting duck against other bulky Pokemon, makes it 
much harder to take advantage of with something like a Skarmory that would otherwise spike over it. Or all over it, rather. So, yeah, that's, uh, th that's the kind of evolution I'm talking about here. We'll definitely explore this concept more in the because each new generation gets stronger and whatnot but you can already see where it's starting and then you know it's retroactive application of course now we go to Gyarados who can run who doesn't run HP flying for stab anymore so Gara again not a really traditional bulky water but it, it does have unique defensive capability and it's in and you know it's not just a traditional bulky water because of its lack of recovery and not healing in sand and whatnot but because now it's stealth rock weak it's the only of these pokemon to actually be weak to stealth rock and that's pretty bad i mean spinning is not the most reliable thing in dpp so it's you can't fully rely on it however gyarados's intimidate is an arceus send in metagames that Gets stronger and stronger, so you're able to check all those D-Deers and Scarf Flygons and whatever you can think of. And Intimidate plus Close Combat Resistance equals great, great check to Infernape and Lucario. I mean, sure, they can adapt and run Stone Edge or whatever, but the its ability to check them as well as it does, which is, well, you know, give you the option to play around them. Again, not immovable, just a very good initial buffer. Uh, before you get to pivot out into less threatening attacks. Attacks that have opportunity cost. Attacks that you can exploit with your other Pokemon. So, so like if, for example, if they have a Stone Edge uh, Lucario, then they are not going to be hurting your Rotom. So, stuff like that. So even with an offensive set, then Gyarados has that natural defensive utility because of good natural... I mean, it's okay physical bulk, but it's, re it's typing more so alongside Intimidate letting it switch it on a lot of physical stuff. So, uh, Suicune has a similar, you know, Gyarados is also a big physical threat itself, and Suicune, the offensive sets, the Timid, Max Special Attack, Ice Beam, HP Electric, then that is actually one of the best answers to Gyarados, but you really, just like in Gen 3, you really do notice its lack of bulk when switching into even stuff like as innocuous as support Titar Stealth Rock. So, Again, something to keep in center. Uh, Trade-offs in Pokemon are a really big deal. So, now Gyarados did have a walling set uh, for a long time. And in turn, it really it wanted more longevity and taking on things like Lucario and Infernape and whatnot. And uh, sleep absorbing against Breloom. Now the thing is it can't actually hurt the Breloom, which makes it hard to deal with in long games. Uh, especially with Stealth Rock being harder and harder to spin away as the metagame went, you know, adapted to the presence of Starmie and Fortress. This thing was paired with Fortress all the time. And, you know, made it harder and harder to uh, keep this thing alive. But in its prime, this, the Rest Talk Gyarados set was a monster. And it roared things around with spikes up and made it hard to deal with when your Zapdos tried to switch in and got roared away immediately. So next time it came in, it was at 50 and it had to roost up or it'd be ruined, so... Um, yeah, this, this thing was a monster. It was Brazilian at handling the fighters and just pretty much everything bulky. Having Intimidate on your wall is really nice. I mean, really... I mean, the, Gyarados isn't a hard DD Knight counter or anything, but it definitely is good at, you know, if you're expecting DD, you switch in and you neuter the DD and it's taken sand and you know, you put it in a weird position, like, does it want to outrage and get roared out, or does it want to just throw a neutral outrage out? And just being able to soften the opponent's attacks was really nice. Now, with stealth, like I said, as Stealth Rock became harder and harder to spin, and, you know, hazards became less super spammable, I mean, this thing invites Starmie like nobody's business, and you're not always going to be able to roar it with hazards up. So, it's, you know, it's definitely not perfect. And with the Rise of Clefable, it got even worse, but, and, you know, bulky Breloom being everywhere, and all those other factors, and this thing fell off. But historically, this was a very important bulky water in the uh, DPPOU metagame. So now let's look to some other defensive waters. Now, Empoleon, this is, this was underexplored in DPP's heyday, and has seen some more use in recent times. Now, uh, Empoleon has some, de definitely some negative traits in terms of uh, being a water type because it's steel typing means it is weak to fighting and ground and so you know exploitable by earthquakes and close combats and crucially it is a water type that does not resist fire 
that really, you know, so we, we've been talking about handling uh, all these offensive physical attackers and these fire types, and Empoleon can't really do that. However, Empoleon steel typing is, of course, also a blessing. You just have to, you can't treat it like a traditional bulky water. You know, we're going into unorthodox bulky water territory now. Because what Empoleon does is, unlike all these other waters, it resists dragon. And it also resists water. This means it switches into two of the toughest to switch in Pokemon in the whole game, Latias and Kingdra. You know, Kingdra completely dominates Kingdra. I mean, Milotic, eat your heart out. And uh, st Steel also means it heals in sand and is resistant to Stealth Rock. And like Swampert, it sets up Stealth Rock. It's also got some great utility moves. I mean, knock off, hell yeah. And then Roar and you know, Ice Beam, it's got a great special attack stat, even, even uninvested and stronger than Vaporeon's even. So you can really do whatever you want with Empoleon. Throw in Toxic if you want. Ice Beam is generally nice for thwarting Breloom, but yeah, throw in your Roar. Again, specifics don't matter. You can run more defense if you like. And Empoleon also has offensive uh, sets with Shookaberry that ha strike a kind of balance between offensive and you know, defensively useful water, but in terms of being a bulky water, this takes a different approach. Like we said, it's not handling those other threats that these other water types are, but it's handling threats, it, at the same time, it is handling threats that these water types cannot. And unlike Swampert, it also, it manages to be sand immune while still resisting water. So something like uh, CB Gera, then you would not be able to thwart with Swampert. But with Empoleon, yeah, sure. I mean, give it some defense EVs, but absolutely. Uh, it can actually make use of that. It's uh, typing in that way. So, uh, yeah, that's those are bulky waters in DPP. Uh, Rotom Wash is Electric Ghost in Gen 4. So, in case you're wondering why I haven't mentioned that, all the Rotom forms are Ghost in Gen 4. And uh, again, Kingdra is not a defensive water type at all. I mean, yeah, sure, it has a Rest Hawk Dragon Dance Outrage set, and that quad fire resistance without being grass weak is really nice. I will say that. But again, it's got the Suicune syndrome of, you know, Stealth Rock, uh, neutral, sand affected, relying on rest for recovery. So yeah, you can definitely get some nice defensive use out of it but you are using it more for that combined with its sweeping potential. So that, and other Kingdras are just straight up offensive. So I'm just going to scroll down. Oh, Tentacruel. Yeah, I knew I was missing something. So again, Tentacruel is not a bulky water because uh, rocks neutral, sand affected, does not heal. And it also does not, uh, what, it, it's also weak to ground. So that's bad. But Again, it's not a traditional bulky water, but uh, so, you know, it's, it can't even check Heatran very well because it's weak to earth power, but it does resist both of Infernape's stabs, just like Starmie. Doesn't mind U-turn either. And in addition to Rapid Spin, it provides toxic spikes, which can be deadly. And it has knockoff too, to really spread the love. So yeah, Tentacruel is really, really nice. And uh, again, not a traditional bulky water, but it's special bulk is great, it's physical bulk is just good enough, I recommend bold. And it's moves are absolutely amazing, so definitely worth fitting on some teams. However, it's not comparable to these other bulky waters, but yeah, absolutely uh, worth mentioning for its niche. So I just want to scroll through UU real quick. You know, these are just UU Pokemon, not really usable in OU, so I'm not missing anything, I don't think. Yeah, okay, so we can move on to Gen 5. Now, Gen 5, in my opinion, is the last generation where the bulky water really was a, was a thing. And even then, you will def this is the evolution I was talking about, you are going to see a vast difference compared to the previous two generations of bulky waters. So right off the bat, the major difference is so far, we've had Swampert, Milotic, Suicune, Vaporeon, Starmie, and then, you know, stuff like Gyarados in the last slot. And then, you know, you throw in some fillers like Empoleon and Tentacruel. Now, we completely get rid of Swampert. We completely get rid of Milotic. We com completely get rid of Suicune. We completely get rid of Vaporeon. Vaporeon technically has some offensive rain use, but that's offensive, not bulky. And even that, it's, it's niche in that. So now, we still have Starmie. Now the bulky water definitely gets a great tool in Gen 5 because of Scald, but the landscape changes so drastically that you are going to see 
you know, just a major, major change. And uh, we have Gyarados here, but Rest Talk, it, thanks to Sleep Talk mechanics, then, uh, or Sleep mechanics in Gen 5 as a whole, then you are not able to, you know, if you, uh, if you switch out before you burn your whole sleep, before you wake up, then your sleep turns reset, so sleep is unusable. So we strike Gyarados as well. So we just have Starmie here, and in the last slot you have Psy Shock or you know, Toxic for Jellicent, but so you know the landscape is already going to be very, very different. Oh, and you got, you got to run a 354 uh, speed for Tornadus uh, minimum, so... Yeah, so now we've got Starmie, and now who else do we have? Well, Tentacruel comes back, and this time it's not just that sand-affected wall, or non-wall. It's instant Now, Tentacruel is one of the most unkillable Pokemon ever, thanks to Permanent Rain and Rain Dish. So it heals infinitely and protects, makes it you know, unkillable. It doesn't even use knockoff, because even though it's a great move, just because of how unkillable it is. And uh, I went over this in my Building Black White Rain video for EV spreads. You can consult that. Again, not really the focus of this one. But, uh, yeah, you can definitely just consult that. Anyway. Uh, here we go. Let's just go with this one as a sample. Anyway. Uh, so, Tentacruel is now the most unkillable thing ever. As spam it, and it can set up T-spikes. It can, you know, sub. It can... Toxic itself, we're just going with this as a sample, and it defined, you know, the bulky water role is now less about countering uh, the fire types in the metagame and more about spamming Scald. Now waters, I mean waters have always spammed status, but now with their main stab going from Surf to Scald, then they become status machines. And Pokemon like Poison Heal Breloom become, and Magikarp Reuniclus become prized for their ability to avoid the Scald burn. So, uh, and uh, this, is especially, this is especially crucial because otherwise a Pokemon like Ferrothorn would absolutely destroy waters. But with Scald, then they completely turn the tables on Ferrothorn. Ferrothorn would otherwise be the biggest enemy to waters. Uh, and uh, another bulky water, Politoed. I mean, people often don't think about Politoed sets because it's just the rain, the rain summoner. But a Scald Protect Politoed is very irritating to deal with, whether it's bold or calm. And uh, can has the toxic thing going on. It can refresh, making it able to shrug off other status from other waters, whether it's Scald or toxic. And uh, it can go Encore, just to really... Bring the pain. It can go Parasong. Again, uh, doesn't really... I think Encore Refresh is the best set nowadays, so I'll be showing that. But again, it, it's really dependent. And uh, if you're going bold max special defense, then... or max, If you're going bold max defense, then you might as well run Ice Beam to help your team out against DD Knight and Garchomp, who are really dangerous. So, you know, now we're not countering the physical threats of the metagame with Waters most of the time. Uh, because usually we're doing, we're uh, delegating that to the ground types, because uh, the physical attackers tend to be strong Earthquakers, so the guys like Excadrill and Garchomp, in addition to big fighters, uh, Terrakion mainly, and for that we delegate that to Gliscor and Lander Asterion. So, uh, there is one bulky water type that rises with uh, Regenerator in uh, Slowbro, in Slowking of course, but Slowbro is the main one because it handles things that are so tough to handle, like Terrakion and Garchomp. So it's also got a great uh, got Fire Blast to really stick it to, again, moveset varies. It can run T-Wave and other stuff. Psy Shock for Keldeo is probably the safest. But uh, yeah, and it handles other things like SD Gliscor as well. So And uh, Regenerator is a huge tool because, yeah, slack off, the instant recovery of sl uh, Slowbro slack off is really nice. But, Regenerator, meaning it heals even more on top of that, is a godsend. And really what, in you know, defensive Pokemon needed a buff in a generation that brought all this power. So I think it was a good addition in Gen 5, for sure. Later generation, or the newer generations, tough to say. But, yeah, Gen 5 was definitely needed. And now you're wondering, well, why wasn't Slowbro used in the earlier generations? You know, instant recovery sounds good, and... The answer is, you know, it's not a... Well, in Gen 3, it doesn't have Slack Off. And in Gen 4, it definitely got some slight usage as a Machamp counter because of own tempo preventing it from being confused by Dynamic Punch. 
but its low special defense means that stuff like HP Grass Heatran and Infernape are just going to run it over, not to mention its pursuit vulnerability. Uh, and it's not healing those off as easily because of its low speed. And it had a small, small niche, but definitely not worth being mentioned alongside those others. Whereas now, Regenerator, I mean, you take a Pursuit from Scarf Tar and you heal most of it off, you're good to go. So Slowbro, not to mention the importance of countering things like Terrakion and Garchomp, which weren't around in Gen 4 OU since Garchomp was banned pre-Platinum. So yeah, Slowbro definitely found you life here. And we also got to mention Jellicent because for the first time, we have a spin blocking water, and I was a huge fan of Jellicent in black and white uh, during the main generation. And, you know, again, Eevee's moveset can vary. I like Nightshade nowadays, personally. But uh, Jellicent is a great spin blocker, great, po really tough to switch around. I mean, water types that can burn. That was a whole thing with Gen 5. And it wasn't just Jellicent, because Rotom Wash is now a water type. So you have this levitating lantern, as I called it, with a, uh, a Gen 5's um, introduction. And it also has that combination of a water type that can burn. So uh, again, Poison Heal Breloom became popular. And things like Natural Cure Grass type, Celebi and Roserade were quite popular in Black and White's heyday. Because unlike Ferrothorn, then you know, Ferrothorn doesn't like burns at all. And they would just shrug them off or not even be affected by them in uh, Breloom's case. So, yeah, Rotom, of course, has a lot of other great traits. It's a water type immune to ground while not being weak to Stealth Rock like a flying type would. It doesn't have amazing recovery, but it has Pain Split, which is very irritating for Stall, and it, of course, provides momentum with Volt Switch. Not to mention, its electric typing is really nice because it gives it a neutrality to electric, helping play around things like Thunderous, Thunderous, uh, uh, regular Thunderous in Black and White 1, Thunderous T in Black and White 2. And its flying immunity is, gives it a resistance to, er, not immunity. Its flying resistance gives it an, the ability to sponge Hurricane from Tornadus. So, uh, throughout the fifth generation, then you saw the, a constant effort in keeping up with rain teams. And Rotom was a huge part of that because of how it took their hits, not just the, uh, the water moves, but also the hurricanes, without necessarily being weak to thunder, like most of uh, water types were. And, you know, it dished out its own pain with Will-O-Wisp and, you know, the momentum-grabbing Volt Switch, which threatened most rain abusers. So, yeah, Rotom was a big, big part of that. And, again, our bulky waters are evolving, as the generations do as well. So, uh, another bulky water I have to mention is Gastron. I don't know who I'm going to take off here. Uh, I have to mention Slowking, who acts like Jellicent. Doesn't spin block, but Regenerator makes it a you know a good special sponge taker, and uh, things like Dragon Tail are really nice for things like Reuniclus. So, uh, yeah, we'll it's just kind of a mix there. Anyway, we're gonna take out uh, we're gonna take out t uh, Starmie because it's the worst nowadays. Uh, Starmie was very popular in late Black and White one and throughout Black and White 2 because it completely dumped on Rainstall with, because of Natural Cure and burning Ferrothorn, ruining it and whatnot. And uh, in Black and White 2, it was a Keldeo check, but over time, you know, it just struggles so much against Ferrothorn and Jellicent and getting pursued, and that makes it a you know, very unsturdy Keldeo check as well. Now, things like Slowbro, Jellicent, and Slowking are also, and Tentacruel, are also very important for their ability to check Keldeo in addition to their other traits. Uh, that really changed a lot in Black and White too, you know, because suddenly your water type, you know, you, if your water type also resists fighting, then you can help check Keldeo, and that was a major thorn in Rotom's side because now, you know, Rotom obviously does not resist fighting, and it doesn't like taking Keldeo's secret swords, so that constricts your team building more. So that is why, you know, that that's another big thing to consider. So, and Starmie, you know, obviously resists both, but it's you know, frail and taken advantage of by all those Pokemon we mentioned. So. And uh, this other Pokemon is Gastrodon. Gastrodon is big because in Gen 4, it had a small niche because of its bulk and its uh, recover. And, um, well, I guess I, while we're talking about Gen 4, I'll mention Quagsire again, who I just realized I forgot. Quagsire had a small niche uh, for a time because of Water Absorb, and it got recover. 
and Gen 4, and Heart Gold and Soul Silver, I believe. So it was able to actually use its bulk and stave off things like Life Orb Gengar, as well as uh, dangerous Pokemon like Offensive Suicune and Starmie and Kingdra. But over time, it also got knocked out of the metagame by you know, Breloom and Clefable. So not that it's unusable, but it's a lot harder to fit. And uh, yeah, so uh, we can mention Quagsire here as well. Now we'll just knock off. Knock off Polly. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to knock off Slowbro because it does similar things, but we'll get to that in a second. So what Gastrodon does is Storm Drain, and you might think, well, didn't Storm Drain exist in Gen 4? And yeah, it did, but it also did not make the user immune to water. It made it, um, it just gave, it had some doubles redirecting stuff going on. Other than that, it was not a, was not an answer. So uh, here's what Gastrodon does. It is a water type that is completely immune to uh, electric, and it is immune to water as well. So think of Swampert if it was also immune to water, which would make it absolutely incredible. And it had instant recovery. And grass coverage is a lot less common on things in Gen 5. So, I mean, there was a time where Rotom was running, was running HP grass because of how popular Gastrodon was. But uh, those are the before times. Anyway, uh, so Gastrodon was amazing because it countered one of the hardest counter, hardest to counter Pokemon in the game, Thunderous. And even Thunderous could use Grass Knot. But again, the initial buffer, you allow yourself a tool to play around that move that has significant opportunity cost. You know, Thunderous does not throw on Grass Knot without giving up another move it really, really wants. So both regular and Therian. So Thunder, uh, Gastrodon was a great counter to that. And it did not care for Specs Hydro Pumps at all because it, you know, it's immune to them. So, I mean, Specs Politoed was terrorizing players because it hits harder than Latios' Draco Meteor. And Gastron just sits on it. Incidentally, so did Jellicent. But Gastron was very popular because of its ability to handle Thunders as well. So, and uh, yeah, and it is completely immune to Rotom Stabs. It blocks its Volt Switch and it, you know, gets a special attack boost from Hydro Pump to say nothing of being immune to it and it punishes it back with Toxic. It doesn't love Will-O-Wisp, but it definitely helps out a lot in that department uh, by Toxic it in return. And other than that, it's just a good, good solid bulky water, good answer to a lot of Heatran sets. HP Grass became a lot less common. Uh, HP Ice became the uh, common Heatran set for the increased amount of Dragon-type threats like Garchomp and Latios, as well as being able to hit things like Gliscor. That was really important. Not that Tran couldn't and didn't run grass coverage, but it was not as effortless, let's say, as its uh, desire to use HP grass in Gen 4. So uh, you might be wondering if Gastron is this great special wall, why it ran, why I am showing it with physical defense. And in Black and White 1, it did run special defense, but in Black and White 2, Keldeo came and Gastrodon without physical defense does not take secret swords well at all. So, uh, yeah, you, you don't want to do that. And you gotta have, you take them well with uh, physical defense. But yeah, you would like to run special defense for like everything else, things like Alakazam. But Keldeo is such a threat that, you know, it, it's warped. That's another example of how it's warped the meta. You can't, uh, you got, it even if forces your Gastrodon to EV itself a certain way, pretty much just for it. I mean, it's also nice for things like Grounds and Dragon Knight, but you know, it's still, it would generally prefer to run Special Defense a lot of the time uh, for shrugging off things like Zam and Latios. So, uh, yeah, there's, there is that. And yeah, you don't want to run Earthquake on Gastrodon. I think that's a mistake because, you know, it switches in a Rotom all the time. It's going to eat burns. May as well not make yourself, you know, may as well not waste a move because it, it effectively is a waste. So, yeah, there's uh, Toxic, and, you know, the last move can be Earth Power, if you like, or Clear Smog, but generally the set is more reliable. Anyway, so yeah, Gastrodon was definitely a huge addition. The water type immune to water, and uh, Earth Power is actually nice for handling Tentacruel, so I would recommend that a lot. Just You'll have to burn Rotom. If you're okay with that, then that's fine. But yeah, uh, hit, hit things like Toxicroak as well. Stab for Gastrodon, especially nice if you get a Storm Drain boost. So yeah, uh, Gastro was a big one. Uh, Thunderous, it still checks Thunderous Therian today, so. 
Uh, now we go to Quagsire, who has definitely fallen off. Because Quagsire was really crucial on Sand and Rainstall early Black and White 1 because of Unaware staving off you know, people who were going crazy over all these offensive threats. These Excadrills, these Terrakions, these Dragonites, all of them are Swords Dancing, Dragon Dancing, and uh, Garchomp as well. And Quagsire just kind of sits on that. So, uh, yeah, it, with physical offense EVs, it's a good check to this kind of stuff. You know, and you know, can burn with Scald, it can just Toxic, can do whatever it wants, really. So, yeah, Quag was very popular then, but then Stall stopped being good at all in Black and White 2, and it completely disappeared off the face of the planet. So, uh, yeah, that was... Uh, but it did have its time. You know, this was thought to be the evolution of the physically defensive bulky water in Black and White 1. You know, the to keep up with these crazy threats, completely ignore their uh, setup. However, you know, it did not last. So, uh, again, these this has been how these guys fare, and it's, again, less about fa staving off the physical attacks of the tier, uh, with the exception of Black and White 1, Quagsire, and then Slowbro, and more about handling the Rain Assault, because that's how the bulky water evolved in... Uh, in Gen 5, the bulky waters have always evolved to meet their changing landscape. So, uh, that is, that's that. So, I think we have everything now in Gen 5. So, in terms of bulky waters, of course. Because uh, Keldeo, not a bulky water, can run some Protect Toxic stuff. Scald Protect Toxic Sword is a great set. But, again, uh, it's offensive. It's not a defensive uh, bulky water. So I think that's pretty much everything. I don't think there's anything else here that... Yeah, you know, Empoleon's UU and... So... Uh, yeah, it, it was crazy how... So, like, look how unrecognizable this list is compared to Gen 4, whereas Gen 4 and 5 were pretty much the same... Or Gen 4 and uh, 3 were pretty much the same lists. So... Yeah, it was, a, it was a drastic change. Now, we're going to go to Gen 6, and it gets even more drastic. So, no more Permarain. So, Tentacruel gone, Politoed gone, Quagsire reduced to stall, Jellicent good, but st Well, so here are Bulky Waters uh, in Gen 5. So, we've got this, and uh, then Toxic, Recover, and... I... Uh, yeah, last move can kind of vary, but we're just going to give it clear smog, actually, because I call mine Clefable. So, uh, now, and the, the last bulky water is a Slowbro, which can also be Mega Slowbro, so we're going to give it the Slowbro Knight to illustrate that balance. So, bulky waters in Oris are interesting because in Gen 5, we already experienced how you know, the metagame was leaning more towards an offensive water direction. And, you know, that, that was, there was definitely something to it. But at the same time, even on offensive rain teams, you tended to have your bulky Politoed and your bulky Tentacruel. So, you would, and your offensive waters, you know, you couldn't fit Starman every team because of its massive frailty holding it back. And Keldeo was amazing, but, you know, that was the main choice. Now, in Oris, you have Keldeo, and not just Keldeo, but Manaphy, and for complete stall breaking, and you know, Starmie is also, okay, we'll fit Starmie in as a bulky water, but you even have Volcanion as an offensive water type now. It really is mostly just Keldeo, but Keldeo in Oris is so much more common than in Gen 5, which is, already, which is amazing, because it's already incredibly common in uh, Gen 5, but in Gen... Six is this metagame defining threat. It's enormous, and so like all these bulky waters are a lot harder to slap on teams. I mean they're not difficult, but Rotom again physically defensive now because it's less about the rain assault and more about physical attackers like Talonflame, Pinsir, uh, Mega Metagross is uh, the most prudent example nowadays. So. And uh, it's less of a wall. I mean, even in the previous generation, R Rotom Wash was not really a true bulky water because it lacked that recovery. And, you know, Pain Split was good, but it wasn't reliable recovery. It was more this annoying pivot that spread status 
and set up opportunities for its teammates, not acting in the vein of a traditional bulky water like uh, all these other Pokemon we've been going over have. And that that's the same here. I mean, these other Pokemon are bulky waters. Starmie's the same as ever, checking Keldeo, spinning. Slowbro uh, does some amazing things and can go for a sweep with Calm Mind uh, with Slowbro Knight. And uh, Jellicent is often used with Culberberry because of... Uh, Pursuit alongside Kelly being so prominent, but Quagsire again re better than Gen 5 because Stall is better in Oris than Gen 5, but yeah, still reduced to Stall. Gastron <laughs> reduced to excuse me, reduced to not reduced, but I mean it's only really on bulky uh, Spike teams that are not nearly as prominent. I mean they're very prominent still, and s those teams with Slowbro are as well. But it's uh, the water type slot as the generations go on, goes to an offensive water type more and more. So in Gen 6, you saw, I mean, you saw this in Gen 5 as well, but in Gen 6, it was absolutely everywhere because none of these water types, besides Quagsire, who is only used on stall, none of these other water types handle something like Bisharp, for example. So uh, Keldeo has, it's still not a defensive Pokemon. Some people actually were using Rest Talk Keldeo with Rocky Helmet to handle Bisharp and Weavile. So, I guess in that sense, then Keldeo for a little while was a bulky water, but uh, at it, but for the most part, it's going to be specs, and that is the defining set. And so, I think, and even bulky sand teams running Keldeo, I mean, that didn't happen for a while. That didn't happen until well after Oris and even Sun and Moon was the main gen, or mostly Oris, I think, but... It really continued into Sun and Moon that because in uh, when Gen Five was the main Gen, then you saw you know your bulky waters, the ones that we just went over. Those were mostly used on Sand teams, and then post Gen, post Oris and Sun and Moon, then you saw a lot more Keldeos in that slot in those slots, because just like in Gen Three and Four, where people want their waters to be more and more offensive, then I think that kind of shift happened retroactively in black and white as well. They were thinking, well, why would I try to wall things with my bulky water when I could just use my fast offensive water type, which is still pretty naturally bulky, and uh, get more offensive pressure out of it. So I think that's the shift of the waters over the years. So, uh, yes, Scald, HP Grass, generally reliable. So, uh, yeah, that's... that's uh, Keldeo for it. I mean, even this Specs Keldeo is not a bulky water, but it's taking the place of water. It's it's the water slot on a lot of teams. And I mean, you see Keldeo and Rotom a lot, even because of um, because of their synergy. And you don't really think of it as running two bulky water types, but they are water types that handle crucial aspects of the metagame and crucially dish out more damage. That's the shift. People want their water types to not just be bulky defensive pivots anymore. They want them to be able to dish out meaningful damage. I mean, you might say Rotom doesn't do a lot of damage, but I would beg to differ because Will-O-Wisp and Volt Switch with Rocks Up is a pain. Not to mention how it indirectly uh, causes a lot of damage by bringing in big threats like Keldeo or Mega Metagross that allow for more damage further. So, And they wouldn't have been able to get on the field as easily without Rotom's Volt Switch help. So... That's the kind of shift we're talking about here. Just more and more bulky because, like, even bulky teams, they often, they love to use Keldeo because, like, yeah, Gastrodon or Jellison or Slowbro or, will check stuff, but Keldeo is fast and it also checks stuff and it's a massive, massive threat. It Oko's Spadef Gliscor, which none of these other Pokemon can do. So that's, that's a big one. And in a way, it is its own defensive utility. So... Uh, that, that's uh, that's the evolution I wanted to mention. I wanted to shine a light on. And if we go to Gen 7, then it... Why does this keep taking my sets away? Did I even put this in? Uh, anyway, yes. Yeah, Gastron runs physical defense in Auras again for uh, Starmie. I swear I put in Toxic and Clear Smog. Does this... Anyway, so... Yeah, so uh, this same evolution of water is getting more and more offensive and making up for their uh, lack of defensive use with their speed and their power, you go even further in Gen 7 because, yeah, you'll sometimes see a Gastrodon and you won't see Starmie anymore. Slowbro is sometimes seen. Jelson is not seen. 
You see Keldeo, not, you know, as a defensive Pokemon. Now, in Gen 7, we, of course, get the mother of all defensive water types in Toxapex, which has Regenerator and Recover, and unlike Slowbro, it's not weak to Pursuit and U-Turn, and it gets Toxic Spikes, and Knock Off, and Haze, and just a, even dumb stuff like Baneful Bunker, so it's just a nightmare. Now, Toxapex is unique because it needs to be paired with a Heatran counter, because Toxapex does not counter Heatran at all, because of its... Uh, unusually low special attack stat in conjunction with its earth power weakness. So you need to pair this with something like a specially defensive Gliscor so you don't lose to Heatran. Uh, but in terms of, you know, bulky watering, this gets it done. And I mean, even defensive Rotom Wash, now it has Defog, but it often also runs uh, Water Z. So you can, uh, you absorb knockoffs better. But you, again, it speaks to the amount of uh, the offensive shift that has occurred. And uh, Toxpex is, of course, the primary with then Rotom and then Slowbro. Slowbro's ability to counter ground types like the Score and Garchomp, which Toxpex cannot do. But uh, the biggest example of Keldeo doing Keldeo things is in uh, Greninja. You know, regular or Ash. I mean, even faster than Keldeo. And you see, you know, otherwise bulky teams using Greninja in as their water type. And Greninja, you know, it'll switch into Heatran once. That's its defensive utility. You know, and if your the opponent's top Bulele locks into Psychic, then you can switch into that. But you know, these two, they find defensive utility through their offense, especially Ash Greninja because of its Water Shuriken. And you know, they even bring more utility with Spikes. No other water type besides, like, Quillfish learns Spikes, and Quillfish is great, but it's, like, a lower-tier Pokemon, so, uh, yeah, Greninja, speaking of which, you surf on Ash Greninja, otherwise you're crazy, but yeah, Greninja is crazy, crazy fast, and so you'll see teams like Heatran, uh, Tornadus, Grass type, so Kartana, Bulu, and stuff like Magearna, uh, did I mention Tornadus? Then, like, a Mega Mawile or Latios or Latias. And then, you know, you'll think, oh, this team could use some bulk, but... Or Scarf Lando, stuff like that. But the water type will be Greninja, so it, players are not throwing... I mean, you can throw Toxpecs everywhere, and you can throw Rotom and, to a lesser extent, Slowbro on a lot of teams, but most players don't want to go, you know, unless you're, you know, going full-out balance with Toxpecs, most players are going with Greninja as their water type just because of the... Or as Keldeo effect, I like to call it. You know, instead of going more defensive with your semi-bulky offensive team, then you go more offensive, and yeah, you lose some defensive integrity, but you make up for it with the super fast, strong Pokemon that can overwhelm the opponent, you know, and in return for, you know, you're not going to be able to switch around threats as well, but in return, you are able to force KOs on the opponent more effectively, so... Uh, the final bulky water we're going to mention is Tapu Fini, of course, which, you know, also provides defog and has some really nice traits like Taunt and Misty Surge's status protection, some underrated moves. So, like, Nature's Madness is fantastic. So, uh, and, so, like, Na Misty Surge is great because it means it protects itself from Heatran's, um, Heatran's, uh, Toxic and Lava Plume, so... I mean, Burn gets nerfed a little bit in Gen 7, so it only does 6%, doesn't out damage leftovers, but it's still an annoying Pokemon, still an annoying status condition, so, and, uh, yeah, so I think that's, that's just about covering all I wanted to cover. I mean, in terms of bulky waters, this is where we're at. I mean, I mostly wanted to focus on Gens 3 through 5, because that's where we, you know, Gens 3 and 4 is where the traditional idea, um... Jitstream and 4 are where the traditional ideas of the bulky water come from, and in the more offensive generations, starting with Gen 5, then we have seen the bulky water retain, you know, what it does, because water types are really nice defensively, but they've also, you know, adapted with the landscape, which is to be expected, but over time, we have seen players go with more offensive variants of water types instead of uh, instead of their defensive counterparts. I mean, the Greninja or Keldeo in Gen 7 and 6, respectively, uh, on 
even bulky teams where you would expect there to be a bulky water type, but no, they want their Keldeo. They want to be threatening and fast. And you even see this in Gens 3 and 4 where people are making their Swamperts fast and strong and using its natural defensive capability but creating more capability for it with its newfound speed and power. So, uh, I think that's about it. That's more or less everything I wanted to cover about this topic. So, uh, I, I don't really want to talk about Gen 8 because I don't enjoy that metagame. It's like new now with the DLC, but... Uh, Toxapex is still a thing there, so <laughs> anyway, so that's uh, more or less everything, so thank you guys for watching, I hope this was enjoyable and entertaining for you, I hope you learned something from it, uh, give me your thoughts on bulky waters and whatever else may come to mind, so come hang out on Discord, all that other fun stuff, and yeah, this has been BKC Thany Fantano, Bulky Waters, forever.